Um, so thank you so much for coming to Rex and Library's second voting information event. Um, tonight I'm so pleased to have our speakers from the ACLU of Virginia speak. Um, in a moment I will introduce them, but I just wanted to let you know that they're going to start off with a presentation. While they're speaking, you're welcome to use the chat to ask questions, um, and then after the presentation, um, they'll be able to answer some of your questions. Um, and you're welcome to add uh, questions after the presentation as well. Um, until um, 8 p.m., and we'll try to fit in whatever we can. Um, and I'll ask that you stay muted during the presentation. So our presenters for this evening are the ACLU of Virginia's Executive Director, Claire Gastaniaga, and the Director of Advocacy, Jenny Glass, um, who will review the changes to Virginia's voting laws and how you can help protect the future of voting. So thank you so much. Cool. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started by sharing my screen. I'm really excited to be with everybody tonight and talk about something actually potentially positive um, in, in the grand scheme of things. There's not that much uh, positive stuff happening right now, but I think we're going to be able to give you at least a little bit of a hopeful take on um, some really positive reforms that the General Assembly made uh, this past session that are going to impact uh, this election now and elections in the future. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Right. Claire, can you see the presentation? There I can. I can see it now. Thank you. Now? So, Claire Gustaniaga, I'm the executive oh. director, and Great. Jenny and I are very happy to be with you this evening. So, let's start by talking about what impact has COVID-19 had on voting? I think we're all pretty well attuned to this, but of course it's increased the importance of absentee voting, either by mail or in person. And as of September 18th, more than 720,000 Virginia voters had applied for mail-in ballots and more than two and a half times as many as the final number of requests in 2016. I'm one of those people, I applied for a mail-in ballot just so I could see how the process worked and mine hasn't come yet. So I'd be interested to see how long it actually takes to get here. But mail-in ballots, everyone needs to know, have, do have one downside, which is that they have a higher rejection rate than in-person balloting for a variety of reasons, either because they're, they arrive late, which the good news is the General Assembly made it less likely that that would be the case. Um, there are mistakes made on filling it out, and there hadn't previously been any opportunity to correct mistakes. Again, the General Assembly's done something to address that. And in the past, we've had a witness signature requirement, which the ACLU of Virginia has done something to fix that. Um, and so we looked at all of those things and um, we'll talk a little bit more about the witness requirement in a minute. So legislative response. Um, in this special session, which was initially called to talk about the budget and COVID-19 and the adverse impact on state revenues, but quickly became a focal point. Uh, one of the things that became a focal point obviously was criminal legal reform. And then the second thing that became a, a focal point was the need to address some of the issues that relate to the barriers to absentee voting. And the good news is that the General Assembly normally um, a special session, the laws wouldn't go into effect until four months after the session uh, adjourned. But these changes were made in the context of the budget amendment which is good news because it went into effect immediately upon the governor's signature, bad news because the reforms only apply to November 2020 and we'll need to do something more if we want these things to continue in the future. But in the governor's amendments that were approved by the assembly, um, registrars were directed to provide um, drop off ballot box locations at every place they have a voting station um, for early, for early uh, no excuse absentee in-person voting, and also to have a, a drop-off box at every polling place on election day. And they were given the discretion to add additional drop-off locations. And we're particularly concerned at the ACLU that people keep an eye out to make sure that those discretionary locations are uh, arrayed and, and placed in places where there's equal accessibility across all of the local population. So for example, in Fairfax County, 
where the government center is in the far western part of the county and it can take two and a half to three hours to get there by bus, be critically important to have additional drop-off locations in the southern uh, southeast part of the of the county um, in order for voting to be freely and equally accessible to everyone um, who doesn't have a car and, and doesn't have easy access to, to the more standard sites. Uh, the budget amendment included $2 million in funding for prepaid postage for mail ballots, which is great, so that people don't have to buy stamps. They also set up a structure that allows you to puts a, a pressure on the registrars and allows you to cure a mistake you've made. So they're supposed to notify you if there's a mistake that you've made in, in filling out the ballot uh, form and you're given an opportunity to fix it so that your vote can still be counted. And then, as I said, unfortunately, these reforms only apply to this November's election. And if we want this kind of a help to voters to continue in the future, we'll have to pass general legislation to do so in, in the 2021 session. Next slide, Jenny. So going back to the witness requirement, you know, this is a Jim Crow vestige. Uh, if you look at Southern states, you know, we used to have a witness requirement that required you to get the witness signature notarized. And many, some Southern states still do. Many still require two witness signatures. Uh, we looked at the witness signature requirement and felt strongly that it was um, a it disproportionately affected voters who were lower income voters who had uh, disabilities or older or uh, black voters and particularly in the age of COVID-19 uh, definitely adversely affected anyone who felt concerned about um, having someone enter their um, quarantine area or their isolation area who, who they couldn't trust to not uh, introduce the COVID-19 virus into their homes. And we felt that there were at least 17,000 Virginians who would be estimated to have their ballots rejected in November uh, if the witness requirement wasn't lifted and they submitted it anyway without the witness requirement and those ballots then would have been rejected. And we also felt like there were a lot of people who would just simply not have voted at all. So we went to court and we went to court last spring and were able to get the requirement lifted for the June 14 um, primaries and then we're recently able to get it extend the June 23rd primaries. Um, and then recently we're able to get it extended to cover the November 3rd elections. Obviously, if we want to change the requirement requiring a witness permanently, we're going to have to go back to the legislature and pass a new law that does that or convince the State Board of Elections that they have the authority, which we think they do, to um, not have the missing witness requirement be an automatic rejection uh, criterion for ballots. But right now we're feeling good because this November you can submit an absentee ballot without a witness signature. Next slide. Um, so my internet is a little bit slow. Shaky. So I'm sorry. Uh, I think that's why it's lagging a little. So if my, if I'm cutting it out, Claire, you can just say, but for now, can you hear me? I can hear you. So um, like Claire said, um, right now and into the future, you don't need a excuse to vote absentee in person um, or to vote absentee by mail. Um, so in the past, um, you would have needed to have supplied one of 17 potential reasons um, for not being able to make it out to your polling place on election day. Um, and hopefully that is going to be a thing of the past completely. We'll never have to worry about that coming back. But um, and people are already voting. I think I saw something today about 69,000 people had already voted in person uh, early in Virginia. That is personally my plan to vote. Um, I will not be I did not request an absentee ballot um, this year, but I will be doing it in person. Um, so um, as of July 1, it's now the law of the land. No more uh, no more excuses for absentee voting. Um, so that started on September 18th going to run through um, to, uh, October 31st. So for to Halloween, you can go in person and vote. Um, it's a really exciting reform um, that I think is going to make it a lot easier for people to participate uh, and a lot easier for people to vote in general, just giving more opportunities um, for people to come out and, and vote. Um, in addition to that, some other reforms that happen along the lines of just making absentee voting easier, more accessible, and just more equitable. Um, Claire mentioned that prepaid postage is something that um, got put into uh, the budget 
um, this year to be able to go into effect immediately, um, $2 million to cover that. This is actually part of a reform or is, was a reform that was passed in the General Assembly session um, this past session that um, now into the future, uh, you will be able to have prepaid postage for your absentee ballots. So Virginia was actually um, in front of this, I think, uh, in many ways in, in passing some of these reforms. And then, um, you know, we're able to go back and they already kind of had this idea they were going to do prepaid postage um, effective starting after this election. Um, and now they're doing it for this election as well. Um, Claire mentioned this too a little bit, but, um, you know, you'll now have more time to get your mail-in absentee ballot counted. So if you mail in your absentee ballot, it has to be postmarked by the 3rd, um, but it can be received by the register by noon um, on November 6th. That's the Friday after the election. So again, um, that's actually probably one of the longer um, periods that, that a state has for, for allowing a ballot to come in and be counted. Um, this is just going to make it a little bit more likely that your ballot would have time to be counted and won't be rejected and not rush the process. Um, and lastly, uh, the deadline for requesting an absentee ballot by mail is the 23rd of October. So actually a month from today um, to, to make that request. Um, and you can be voting in person absentee with no excuse all the way up through Halloween. Um, if you're gonna request a mail-in uh, ballot, do it now. <laughs> don't wait till the 23rd yeah, of October. I would say <laughs> don't wait. Um, and similarly with voter registration, don't wait to register. I mean, these are all things, you know, do it as early as you can. Um, but we want you to be apprised of all of the deadlines associated with it, um, of the ultimate last time that you can do it. Because um, if you're not so, registered, you need to register by the 13th. Yes, um, in order to be a part of the process this year. Um, but, and we'll talk about this in, I think, the slide after this, um, hopefully it's a thing in the past as well, that um, voter registration deadlines are going be, um, to be gone starting in, in 2022. Um, but we'll talk about that. So some different reforms that happened with uh, voter registration this past session. Um, we now have automatic voter registration in Virginia. So starting on uh, July 1, if you're conducting any form of like a tra any transaction um, with the DMV or you're accessing the website and you're not registered to vote or you um, need to update your registration, the DMV is gonna automatically register you as long as you're qualified to vote. Um, the new system is actually opt out, which is what we would have al always preferred pass. Um, there are some states that do opt in, um, and this actually makes it significantly more likely um, statistically that people will just register because they will have to check less boxes this way. <laughs> um, they would actually have to go out of their way to say, I don't want to register to vote. Um, please don't put me in the system. I don't want to be registered. Um, so we'll definitely see an uptick here um, of voter registration just because of that. Um, but a few other things that happen with voter registration before we talk about um, same day voter registration um, is that there you know, have been restrictions in the past in Virginia where you can register people to vote. Um, well, some of these restrictions were around being in public high schools or um, being at naturalization ceremonies. So a couple of bills passed this year to um, just create more opportunities for people to be registered. So um, a bill passed this past year that would require public schools to provide voter registration materials and actually give students time to fill those out at school. Um, this is just my assumption, but because Virginia already has online voter registration, I'm hoping the pandemic is not going to make that a more challenging bill to put into practice. Um, but uh, they also opened it up at naturalization ceremonies that it's another opportunity um, for the public to um, register folks to vote. Um, the last one on here is really just talking about voter registration denial. And I think this is something that um, it's actually a really, uh, a really great thing that they took care of that um, before this bill uh, uh, passed, um, you could essentially have a problem or a mistake on your voter registration form. And it was kind of luck of the draw whether or not you found out about that. Um, and most people, at least folks, when, when I did a lot of voter registration um, in political campaigns, sometimes people will find out that when they get to the polls that day that they're not registered and they didn't realize that they had an issue with their form um, and they didn't notice that they didn't get the card, any number of things. So what this would actually uh, mandate is that the registrar would have to um, notify anyone within five days of the denial that they were denied to register to vote so that they can fix their form, they can re-register and, and, and get that corrected. Um, so I think all these things are going to make voter registration um, hopefully a lot easier so that more people register um, and we can increase that number of, of registered voters in Virginia. 
um, I've been mentioning this quite a bit, but it's because it's my favorite reform. Claire knows this um, because we worked a lot on it in the uh, General Assembly session this last year. But um, we passed uh, same-day voter registration. So starting in 2022, um, it has not gone into effect yet, which is why I think it hasn't gotten as much coverage um, because I think this is a, a huge reform for Virginia. Um, we're joining um, the ranks of 19 other states that have adopted some form of uh, election day or same day voter registration. And what this bill does is it eliminates voter registration deadlines um, and it allows an eligible voter to register to vote year round, um, including on election day. So it creates essentially um, what would be known as like early one stop voting where someone can go register and cast their ballot at the same time um, for a, a window of time up to election day. Um, this is probably one of the most impactful reforms when it comes to bringing racial equity and just generally more equitable access to the ballot um, to just remove barriers of any kind so that if someone decides that they want to vote, you know, five days before the election, they can register, they can go and they can support whoever they want to support and they can participate in the system. And a lot of these, you know, Claire mentioned before, kind of having you know, racist roots to a lot of these restrictions barriers that we've put into place. And Virginia for a very long time has, has had very rigid and has been known as one of the hardest states to vote in. Um, you know, and I think we're, we did a lot to walk some of that back in this past session. Um, there's still more to go though, um, which, which Claire and I are gonna talk about too and how to make these more permanent. Um, but a few more reforms, a few more positivities um, for you on this call tonight. Um, they, I think this is one that most people probably are aware of, but um, election day is now a state holiday. Um, so it's gonna be recognized the first Tuesday in November. This is gonna help expand access to really millions of Virginians to be able to give them time to go vote um, and hopefully no longer make voting something you have to squeeze in. Um, also providing more accessible ballots. Um, so starting on in 2021 on September 1st, the State Board of Elections um, is going to have to provide voting and election materials in languages other than English. I believe this is something they already had an option to do, like they could do it. And a lot of these reforms are kind of like they could do this, but um, creating mandates around this that, that make that more accessible. Um, and then keeping better records. So the State Board of Elections now has to keep uh, a record of your ballot, whether it was cast on a machine or on paper. Um, this is gonna help increase accuracy during recounts and create more credibility for election results, which I think is something that everybody would really like. Um, and, um, something that we, we certainly are, are um, looking forward to going into effect, I believe, this year. Um, the last reform I'm going to talk about, or set of reforms, is something that I think got quite a bit of coverage this year. Um, but in case anyone is not aware, voter ID was repealed. Um, so this list of acceptable ID should actually look pretty familiar because it's if you lived in Virginia around 2011, um, 2012, because that's when when we took these away, but you know, now you can use a voter registration card, a bank statement, utility bill, paychecks, um, obviously a DMV issued ID or a passport or a driver's license, um, and really any government document that shows your name and your address. Um, we got a question about this last time, so I'm just gonna put it out there in case if anyone's curious. You can use a student ID, um, and it doesn't have to be from a, um, a university or college in Virginia. It can be from any, um, any college, any university. Um, and this part I think is actually really neat and something we had, um, I wanna say back in 2012, but it's been put back into place, um, is that uh, even if you don't have any of these forms of ID, um, uh, you can sign a sworn affidavit that you are who you say you are. Um, there is a penalty that if you are lying, it's a felony, um, but it does create you know, an opportunity for someone to be able to vote and not have to vote provisionally. Um, so lots of really exciting reforms, um, a real mouthful of all of these things, but I think that one of the most important things is really to notice that, um, think about where we were and how it's great that all these things are possible and that this is like, this, these things are the stroke of a pen. Um, these types of changes that can enfranchise people can make the ballot a far more accessible opportunity for folks to have a political voice. Um, but I think that it is also possible to go right back and we see this sort of yo-yo effect happen in Virginia a lot where um, you know, you do a lot of really good reforms and then um, a new, you know, a change of guard and then you see the reforms go away and then you see it come back. And, you know, voter ID is something they've been working on 
messing around with uh, in the early 2000s, 2008, 2012. So, you know, in the ACLU, we really want to focus on permanent transformational and sustainable reforms. Um, so Claire's going to talk a little bit about an effort that we've been working on for feels like forever, um, but feels a lot more real lately, um, the right to vote. Yeah. If you think about our old absentee ballot law with the 17 to 19 different excuses, that was just a system of privileging some voters over others and giving some voters special rights that other voters didn't have. So you had a special right to vote absentee if you were pregnant or if you were out of town on business or even on a vacation or you had a, the privilege to vote absentee um, if you were caring for somebody who was not well, but you weren't privileged if you were caring for your kids and you weren't privileged if you were looking for a job. And there were all these different ways in which our system was structured to enhance the opportunity for some people to vote, but not others. And so now that we've gone to no excuse absentee, now that we've gotten rid of the ID barrier, there are lots of people in Virginia who don't have government issued photo IDs, which is what we were requiring. They were, you know, born at home. They don't even have a birth certificate. Um, and particularly older Virginians fit in those categories. And again, we were, we were essentially creating barriers to voting. So it's really important that we recognize that voting is basically the essential currency of our democracy. And we should stop allowing government to tell us when we can use it and where we can spend that currency. And, and, and we certainly shouldn't let government take it away from us or tell us that some people have you know, more privileged rights to use it than others. And the only way we're gonna get there is to change our state constitution. We do still have in our Virginia constitution two constitutional limitations on access to the ballot box. One is uh, a Jim Crow era um, a provision that disenfranchises anybody convicted of a felony um, for life unless a governor chooses to give it back. And we're only one of three states that do that, permanently ban a person with a felony conviction from voting for life, regardless of what the felony is. I mean, the felony doesn't have to have anything to do with voting. The felony can, I mean, it's a felony to steal a $5 chicken, um, you know, and you can lose your right to vote permanently. It's a felony to throw an onion ring at a police officer and you, you can lose your right to vote permanently for that. And so what we're thinking is that it's time for us, and the antecedents of that requirement came out of the period of the black codes, which were special criminal laws that only applied to black people that were enacted in Virginia and Southern states. And they criminalized conduct that wasn't criminalized for white people. And it, they did it in order to create these felonies that would then disenfranchise somebody because after reconstruction, um, there were about a hundred and, somewhere between 130 and 150,000 uh, black voters in Virginia. And in the 1902 constitution that firmed up this, uh, this um, disenfranchisement and also added the poll tax and the literacy test to, as additional barriers, uh, the number of people qualified to vote who were black fell from over, uh, you know, from 150,000 to, to fewer than, than I think 30, 20,000, 30,000. And, and so we're in a situation in which we have this historical disenfranchisement in our constitution and it's time for it to go. And it's really important that it go now because we need to make sure that every person in Virginia, 18 and over, has a right to vote that can't be taken away and, and can't be abridged by law so that all of these reforms that have now taken place and are enhancing our ability to go to the polls uh, can't be repealed by the legislature next year or any year in the future. Um, we count about probably 300,000 Virginians that are disenfranchised right now. The majority of those people are, are black and other people of color. Uh, you know, Terry McAuliffe, restored the right to vote to about 170,000 people, but a majority of those people were white. And the reason why that was the case is because in 1995, we went to no parole, and that happened to sync up with the war on drugs that was disproportionately visited on uh, black people and other people of color. So after 95, you not only had more people being arrested and pushed into the criminal legal system, and more of them who were um, black and, and other people of color, but you also had the 1995 law that made all of their sentences longer. 
So as time has gone on, uh, the proportion of people uh, in the system who cannot get their rights back, even under the current more automatic governor's rules, um, uh, continue, is, continues to grow by 12,000 people a year are become felons. And uh, every one of those people gets added to this list. And the current governor has only re-enfranchised 36,000. So in order for us to get where we want to go, which is everybody gets a right to vote, um, and if we relied on individual governors to do it, we'd be looking 30 years out even to stay, you know, to get the backlog um, taken care of and, and the new disenfranchisees restored. So we're really beginning the process. We, uh, Senator Mamie Locke introduced a, a resolution in 2020 session, SJ8, and she's going to reintroduce a resolution in 2021. Uh, the process for changing the Constitution is an arduous one. We have to get a resolution through the General Assembly twice with an intervening House election. So we want to pass it in 21 and then again in, in 22 after the House is reelected in 21. But it's really singularly important now that we've moved from being one of the worst states in the nation in terms of our access to the ballot box to one of the better ones. It's really important that we make sure that we can't go back. And it's particularly important given what's going on in Washington um, because you know our voting rights are not gonna be uh, rights that are um, at the federal level uh, in a, in, for the foreseeable future um, restored. And so we wanna be sure that in Virginia, when we're voting for local offices and state offices, that it's very clear that every Virginian 18 and over has a right to vote and the right to vote that the General Assembly can never take away again or condition in a way that takes it away. Next slide. So how are we going about this, Jenny? <laughs> um. Well, <laughs> with a lot of things. Um, so uh, we helped form the Right to Vote Coalition back in late 19, uh, 2019, um, kind of coming up um, in, in getting, I mean, a, a lot of folks into the legislature that we thought potentially might be um, more willing to support expanding voting rights. And I think that we saw um, uh, some political will expanded to you know, mentioning all the different reforms that we just talked about. But this is gonna take a lot of political will. It's gonna take a lot of calling your legislator and making it clear that um, you want this, you know, this, this racist vestige out of the constitution. Um, and um, so one of the things that we're actually working on um, through, through this coalition is uh, launching, a, you know, ca launching our campaign through an exhibit uh, with um, the Richmond Public Library um, that's going to be hosted digitally, obviously, in the situation that we're in here. But um, it's really going to take a look at the, the history of criminal uh, disenfranchisement, the history of voter suppression, and the deliberate and, and really willful suppression of the black vote. Um, if you look back through, and Claire mentioned this, but I mean, if you, if you look back through history, when you see criminal disenfranchisement begin, when you see that transition into felony disenfranchisement, when you see this expansion and reconstruction of you know, these broad felony disenfranchisement laws going into state constitutions in the 11 former Confederate states, it's very obvious what the goal was. And it was a one-two punch um, with the creation of um, these black codes that Claire mentioned, you know, over-criminalizing black people for vagrancy, being unemployed, you know, these socioeconomic statuses, um, and then taking and then stripping them of their right to vote once they were criminalized. That is um, the playbook of the, of the Reconstruction Era South. Um, and then we cemented it in 1902 and really haven't taken a, a, a look at that since, and it's 2020. So um, on one hand, it sounds kind of nuts, what Claire just said, you know, we have to get this, ma you know, this massive thing passed through two different sessions. But on the other hand, it seems ridiculous and completely far-fetched that we would still um, be tolerating this um, today, uh, disenfranchising 300,000 black voters um, at one point, 20, tw over 20% 20 of our African-American voting population was disenfranchised in Virginia. Um, and that number is likely smaller now um, due to the, the efforts that Claire mentioned, but um, we're adding to it all, every day um, because we're still over-criminalizing Black people. We're still over-felonizing um, Black people. Those practices are still rampantly happening. Um, so I digress. Um, the coalition is going to launch this exhibit. 
Uh, we have uh, some uh, lobbying committees. We have this, this really wonderful committee working on the campaign launch. Um, and you'll be able to see all of this um, probably around October 12th. That's the date that we're working with right now to launch it. Um, uh, and we can certainly reach back out and, and push that out so that everyone can see it. But you'll definitely be able to find it on our website at aclu.va.org. Uh, um, but we're also actively working on lobbying um, the Senate Privileges and Elections Committee. That's going to be um, probably one of the first stops for uh, for this amendment. And and so all of the senators that are part of that committee are really important um, decision makers in this and can either stop this before it gets going um, or they can support it and, and let it run through the session and we can continue to work on it. But this could be the first kind of big stopping point for us is, is in the Senate. Um, so I would I I prepared this a little while ago of just naming these people, but I actually think there's a handful of folks that um, since we're in you know Fairfax County and this is the Reston Library, um, one of the senators that um, is going to be really important in this is Janet Howe. Um, she's in the Senate Privilege and Elections Committee. So if anyone is listening, that if that's your legislator, that's your if that's your senator, please reach out to her and and have a conversation about what we just talked about and um, and say I I don't want this in the constitution anymore. And I realize that, that, you know, that's a, that's going to be an arduous task, but um, the beginning of that falls on your shoulders. And I expect you to do that. I expect you to pass this. Um, there's a list of people, but I wanted to mention Janet Howell specifically because when we're talking to Reston tonight, um, but a lot of the, a lot of the folks um, on the Senate privileges and elections are in Northern Virginia. Um, uh, they're a little bit, they're a little spread out, but you know, we have, um, we have the ability to have, we have a democratic majority in the Senate. <laughs> So if y'all on this call, you know, believe that Democrats should be supporting this or that you believe, you know, a Republican should be getting behind this, you should give them a call and let them know. Um, so I'm going to name a handful that I think if anybody that's listening, um, has, you know, has a relationship or just wants to reach out if you're a constituent, um, Senator Scott Surreville, um, who's in Fairfax, uh, Boisco, Jennifer Boisco, Janet Howell, like I mentioned, um, Jill Vogel, um, and uh, Adam Evan. Um, would, would all be wonderful people to reach out to, and especially Cray Deeds. I don't think there's anyone on the phone tonight that, that uh, is a constituent of Cray Deeds, um, he's out in Charlottesville um, in Bath County, but, but if you are, he's the chair um, of that committee. Um, so, and you can certainly have an impact, especially if you are a constituent um, of any of the folks that I just mentioned. The one thing that these legislators always say is meaningful is if they hear from a constituent. They really don't hear from constituents that often, um, and, and so when someone calls or writes in them an email and says, I actually live in your district, they, they tend to take it seriously and they will often agree to meet with you. These are not celebrities. They are part-time employees um, <laughs> uh, that, that go to the General Assembly in January um, and they have the option to do this. So um, really excited to get people to join the campaign and be a part of it. Um, you can learn more about it on our website, aclu.virginia.org. Um, but we have a lot of organizations helping us do this and we're really excited to launch this in, in mid-October. Um, I think at this point, oh, and we're updating. We're, there's um, your tell your legislators. Oh, and the last thing we wanted to encourage you to do, especially if <laughs> if you're going to be off because you're a state or local employee and you for sure have election day as a holiday, if you can think about being an election official um, or a poll worker, one of the concerns that people have is that a lot of the folks who've traditionally fulfilled those roles are retirees who are in the COVID vulnerable populations. And so those of us who are um, not as vulnerable, if we can volunteer to be officers of election on election day, that will really help facilitate voting for everybody. So I think it's, uh, there's a, this website, uh, which is on the State Board of Elections website um, under officer of elections is a good place to go look to be able to see how to apply to be an election official. And it's a really good way to spend your day off. I actually think I'm going to um, apply to be a election official this year. Yeah. It'll be interesting. We'll see how yeah. it goes. So this is just, you know, um, so this, this is our little questions. thing that shows you exactly what happened before and now where we are now. And um, and just see how much progress we've made and, and see how important it is for us to solidify that progress with a constitutional amendment that makes sure that everybody 18 and over has a lifetime right to vote that can't be taken away. So questions, right? 
Yes, definitely questions. So if you have a question, um, please feel free to submit it in the chat. Um, if you're not able to submit in the chat, you're welcome to unmute yourself and state your question. Um, while I am waiting for those to come in, um, I have a question, um, which is now that Virginia has started voting, have you seen any trends or uh, regarding voting or access um, you guys are looking at or working on? Claire, I think I'll let you handle that one as far as um, any big issues. I do want to put out there that I think, you know, people should definitely vote and, and, and not be worried about, you know, um, long lines or anything like that. But um, obviously that's not the ACLU's business. We tend to, to deal with uh, the, the less savory, you know, kind of trends of, of voting. So. Well, I mean, I think what we're seeing already is that people are, are really taking advantage of the no excuse in person op option and, and that disproportionate numbers of people have already voted. And that means not by mail, that means by going and, and showing up and, and voting in person. And, and that is not just happening in Fairfax and, and Northern Virginia, it's happening across the state. Uh, that is, is good. I think people are, start, are really looking at the, the election day now as the election month. And uh, I think people are gonna be actively voting between now and, and Halloween. And, uh, and then some people will choose still to vote on election day. And one of the things that the ACLU is focused on is making sure that on election day, that the polls are safe and people feel comfortable going vote because um, there will be, we're encouraging registrars to provide masks for voters who show up without masks. We're you know, making sure that we're encouraging the registrars to make sure that every election official understands how to meet CDC standards in terms of cleanliness and, and sanitizing things after people have touched them. And so, I mean, I, I, think, I think our goal is to make sure that every, every way that you can vote is a safe and, and easily accessible way to vote. So in-person absentee without an excuse, mail-in ballot without a witness signature and going to the polls on election day and knowing that you're going to be in a safe place and not a place where you necessarily would face really a disparate likelihood of exposure. Yeah. Um, um, I think we have two questions in the chat. Well, the first one is, um, does the ACLU have any interest in eliminating the electoral college system? Not a state specific state issue, but I'd be interested to know. Uh, the, the ACLU in Virginia and nationally are firmly uh, in favor of eliminating the electoral college system, and our national has been an advocate for that at the federal level, which uh, the other thing that states are doing is talking about whether we can uh, enter into some kind of state compact that would have the same effect, even if it doesn't abolish the electoral college directly. Yeah, this past uh, General Assembly session, we worked with National Popular Vote in support of their legislation. Um, they had House Bill, I just pulled it up, just to try to remember it, uh, House Bill 1777. Um, and they actually had someone that was like focused on Virginia, which was interesting. So we were there to, you know, try to be supportive. We, it wasn't one of our priorities in the General Assembly session, but um, I met with National Popular Vote and they were lobbying legislators. So um, they obviously see Virginia as a place where they might be able to do that route that Claire kind of mentioned, that idea of creating a state compact and getting enough states to say, let's throw this thing out. Yeah, huge supporter. Get rid of it. Um, yep. So. And then it looks like the next question we have is, um, if you apply for an absentee ballot and it does not seem to arrive after a long time, can you go and vote in person? Well, you can, but um, like, as a person who requested an absentee ballot by mail, I, I have to wait for mine and, and I can carry it unopened with me and then vote in person on the machines if I want to, if I go to the election site. Or um, if it doesn't come and I, or, I, or I lose it or something, you can still go vote, but you have to vote provisionally, which means you vote a provisional ballot and then they hold on to it and make sure that you aren't also your um, absentee ballot doesn't also come in. So the timing of things could be that it, it you know, it, there are lots of things that can happen in that circumstance. But if you apply for a, an absentee ballot and it doesn't come and you should go and vote, um, but you will have to vote a provisional ballot and they will hold on to it until they make sure that you're not voting twice by having submitted both an absentee ballot and, and the ballot when you went to cast it in person. 
I would also be like, I would be proactive about it. I know that's, it's not, uh, you, you can know, track online. Answer. Yeah. I wouldn't, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a great situation where we feel like we don't know if, if it's coming or not, but, um, Claire, did you, they put trackers on it this year, right? So yeah, you can track online. So I haven't gone online to see where mine is yet, but I probably will do that tomorrow, but you can go online and, uh, on the, on the Department of Elections website, and you can track where your request is because the the uh, you, if you apply online, you can track online. And when they send it out, it has tracking information on it, yeah. so you should be able to know where it is. Yeah. Um, anyone else have any other questions? Um, if, I'll give some people a minute. Um, I, I was kind of curious. Um, you all made a couple of recommendations during the presentation to request a mail in ballot now. You know, don't wait to register. Is there anything else you want um, junior voters to, to think about or um, plan for um, for voting? Well, I think the most important thing is to have a plan. So, you know, uh, I used to say to folks when we didn't have all these options, you know, think about election day and make sure that you've got your, you know, your ride to the polls, you, that you have your uh, child or, or elder care situation taken care of, you know, make a real plan and an appointment for yourself and put it on your calendar. Um, now I, I say to people, make a plan and decide which of the various ways that you could vote that you're going to choose to use. And if it's like Jenny is going to just go and vote in person absentee, she's going to pick a day and she's going to go to the registrar's office and, and get that done. Um, I'm going to fill out my ballot that I get by mail, and I'm going to hand carry it to put into a, a, a ballot box at the registrar's office. I'm going to have my husband with me. He's going to be voting like Jenny in person absentee. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's always um, returning the ballot by mail and and the U.S. Postal Service. I, I don't know if you all got one, but I got a postcard that was really nice from the Postal Service saying how seriously they took their job and, and talking about making sure that you, um, you know, uh, mail in time for it to be received. And I think the other thing that we probably should acknowledge here is that because we've given um, people the option to postmark their ballot on election day, it used to be that the registrar had to receive your absentee ballot by um, by the close of polls on election day. And now they, it has to be postmarked that day if you mail it, but it can be received up until Friday. Well, that has the potential to delay elections uh, results in the sense of, you know, if that, if a lot of people are using vote, you know, ma mail-in ballots and it's a close election, particularly when we get to the local elections and the, and the state legislative elections, we need to get a little bit more comfortable with the fact that we're not going to know, you know, by nine o'clock on Tuesday night necessarily who's who's won an election, and that and that to, for every vote to count, we won't know the actual final results of the election until Friday at noon. Um, I have actually have a follow up on that that I wanted to ask you about, um, but but first I wanted to add to there really isn't anything better than than helping other people make plans. You know, reaching out to two or three of your friends, relational organizing and doing that on your own and, and walking them through a plan. It seems kind of asinine, but um, people are significant. Just like if you write your New Year's resolutions down or you write a goal down, they're significantly more likely to do them if they wrote it down, if they said something. It's, so the more layers of that you can do with people and walk them through, um, this is me getting back into my organizer days of just like trying to talk to people at a door and saying, you know, are you going in the morning? Are you going to go in the afternoon, evening? Um, oh, great. What day, you know, who, are you bringing anyone with you really try to, you know, visualize that, um, that doing the activity uh, makes it significantly more likely that it's going to happen. Um, but the other thing I wanted to ask as far as the, um, well, I'll say one more thing, I think as a tip. Um, I think sometimes folks think that um, talking about long lines and, and posting, you know, photos and, and things like that um, help spread awareness about what to expect. Unfortunately, that tends to have a chilling effect on turnout. So <laughs> I'm always the proponent of um, share the information, but think about the images that you're putting out there and that you're, sh that you're sharing because, you know, maybe 
your close personal network doesn't isn't as bothered by seeing a long line, but the person that was maybe thinking about going, maybe not thinking about going, that long line just totally sent them in a tailspin and they are not doing it anymore. So it's important that when you're talking about voting with your friends or your family, you know, just kind of communicating that it's easy, that it's accessible. Talk about some of these wonderful reforms. Those are exciting um, to try to make it a little easier to vote. But, you know, the reality is like, you know, there could be a line. <laughs> um, but how much you want to share about that is, um, is up to you. Uh, the question I was going to ask you, Clara, Don't you wish like, there was a function like, like there is um, on uh, Waze and a number of other apps where it'll show you, like you're going to the coffee the shop and it'll show you where the, where the peaks of, uh, of the, uh, the customer peaks are. I, I, we, need a, we need an app like that for, for voting so you can time your... Uh, your presence. Yeah, time is times really less well. attended. <laughs> the, well, the follow-up I was actually going to ask is about um, kind of to, to Dale's question, because um, I'm not actually not, not confident of the answer. In Virginia, can they count, can they start counting ballots before election day or do they have to uh, count, they can only start counting them after or on? Yeah, the, you know, here, and, and it makes sense because, you know, the concern here is one that if you, if people start counting the, you know, tabulating the results before election day, there's the potential for that information to leak and to have an adverse impact on turnout, on the election, on a lot of things. And so it's always been the case that they couldn't even start counting the absentee ballots they had until five o'clock on election day. And I don't think they changed that. They may have finessed it a little bit. But I mean, it makes good sense that for security reasons and to ensure the that, you know, it's like Californians always complain in national elections because, you know, people are calling the election before California even, you know, has its polls closed. And I think there's this general concern about early results getting out and, and somehow skewing the election. And so it, but it does mean that the more people who vote uh, absentee, particularly who mail it in, the longer it's gonna to take to tabulate the results. Or do you think that registrars and state election offices are sufficiently? And hear you, Jenny. Oh, can you hear me now? No, it's really mm -hmm. soft. Yeah, really soft. Oh. Don't know what happened to you. <laughs> um, but this might be what Jenny was um, asking. Uh, someone had put in the chat, and you kind of answered this. But if there's anything else you wanted to add. Um, Someone's asking, given that a large turnout is expected for this election, are the state election office and registrars sufficiently geared up to handling the count? I, I, think, I think that's a good question. And if I were, um, if I were in Fairfax County, I'd be posing, posing that question to my county registrar and to my um, county electoral board. I know Kate Hanley is the secretary of the electoral board here. Um, and I think, you know, just, just calling your local registrar, calling your, the, one of the members of the, of the electoral board here and asking that question is, is important. I mean, one of the, as I mentioned earlier, one of the concerns we have is that all the new ways of, of submitting your vote be um, equally accessible to everybody. And it is not the case that the government center is equally accessible to everybody in Fairfax County. So the longer that goes on without there being alternative sites, the more privileged the people who can drive there are in terms of their ability to vote uh, in-person absentee. Now I know Fairfax is gonna be opening uh, other sites later on, but they are essentially uh, setting up a system in which um, some voters have greater access to uh, early, early in-person absentee voting than others. And that, you know, we're supposed to have a uniform system of voting in Virginia, and we're supposed to have a system that's legally and fairly accessible to all voters, regardless of where they live in the county or, um, and, and uh, their socioeconomic status and their ability to get to the polls. So I think it's really important to ask questions right now because the budget amendment does give the registrar discretion to put additional, the, uh, additional um, ballot boxes uh, for drop-off boxes around the county in places that are not locations for satellite voting. Satellite voting locations are set. They had to be done by ordinance. They can't be changed. But, this, but your registrar has the ability to do additional drop-off boxes 
and to really array those around uh, the county in a way that's complementary to what exists with, between the government center and the satellite centers. And, and I would encourage you all to make that an issue um, with, your, with your local officials. Thank you. Um, we, we haven't gotten any additional questions, so okay. do you have any parting words? Thank you so much for all the information you've provided for us. Well, go vote and, uh, and call your legislator and tell them that you want the Constitution to guarantee that right to everyone. Okay, and we've got a second on that. <laughs> um, again, thank you so much to our presenters from the ACLU of Virginia. Um, we were so pleased to be able to host you for tonight's event. Thank you everyone for coming. Hope you have a wonderful and safe evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>